Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Research Spotlight episode, we're joined by Antonio Laporte. Antonio earned his bachelor's degree in chemistry at North Central College, where he carried out undergraduate research under the supervision of professors Jeff Bjorklund and David Rausch on site selectivity and radical halogenation reactions. In 2018, he came to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign to pursue his PhD, which he's currently doing in the group of Professor Martin Burke. His work is currently focused on the development of new transition metal catalyzed stereospecific cross-coupling reactions and their applications in small molecule synthesis. And from there, I'll hand the floor over to you, Antonio. Thank you very much for joining us to share your work. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in, and thank you so much, Matthew, for the invitation to share my work. Today, I'll be describing some of our group's recent work that was published in ACES Catalysis, where our overarching goal is to start to expand CSP3 variants of the Suzuki Miura cross coupling reaction into chemical space occupied by stereochemically complex small molecules like polyketide natural products, and ultimately to simplify and modularize their synthesis. The reason the Burke Group is so interested in expanding the Suzuki Miura reaction into three dimensional chemical space is that iterative cross coupling is an extremely powerful synthetic strategy that simplifies the synthesis of diverse classes of small molecules. For example, our group and many others have used this strategy to generate drug molecules, natural products, and even highly three-dimensional scaffolds where cross-couplings were used to generate a linear precursor that could then be cyclized. For a long time, a major limitation to this synthetic strategy was that the Suzuki Miura reaction was only highly efficient at forming bonds between sp2 hybridized carbon atoms, making the synthesis of many stereogenic center containing small molecules challenging. However, Recent advances in CSP3 cross-coupling technology suggest that CSP3-rich, stereochemically complex molecules could also be amenable to this simple and highly modular synthetic strategy. I'm going to summarize some of the major challenges that have been overcome in this field over the last few decades, but this single slide does not do the work justice, so please check out some of the references I've provided at the bottom for a deeper look. First, when using a CSP3 cross-coupling partner, Beta hydride elimination is often a rate competitive process that generates undesired alkene side products. This can often be remedied by employing bulky ligands, many times buckweld type, that are able to block the interaction of a beta hydride with palladium. A second important issue is the low reactivity of alkyl organoboron nucleophiles, especially secondary alkyl. One strategy employed to remedy this relies on Lewis Basic or other nearby functional groups to have an activating effect on organoboron nucleophiles. Here's a nice example from the Morkin group showing that a strategically positioned hydroxyl group can promote the cross-coupling of an otherwise unreactive secondary alkyl pinnacol bronic ester. Finally, alkyl organoboron nucleophiles are able to undergo two stereospecific stereodivergent transmetallation mechanisms. The stereoretentive mechanism is thought to be similar to what is observed in CSP2 chemical space where the alkyl group is transferred within the square plane of palladium. Now, because the nucleophilic carbon atom is sp3 hybridized, it can also undergo a stereoinvertive transmetallation mechanism that is proposed to occur above or below the palladium square plane. Differentiating between these mechanisms can be challenging but the Burdick group, as well as Sigmund and Bisco labs, have shown that phosphine ligands can be tuned to enable high levels of stereospecificity while controlling which transmetallation mechanism is dominant. Some of my colleagues in the Burke group were recently able to leverage these advancements in iterative cross-coupling sequences to generate molecules like the one I'm showing here, even in an automated manner using our group's small molecule synthesizer. However, I think it's fair to say that we are still not making complex, many stereogenic center containing small molecules using these modern CSP3 cross-coupling strategies. Perhaps a prototypical example of the kinds of molecules I'm talking about is the polyketide natural products. A quick look at these molecules reveals repeating units like the alpha-methyl beta-hydroxyl polypropionate motif that is extremely abundant throughout natural products. So we ask the question, how can we start to construct these fragments using modern CSP3 cross-coupling technology? We quickly see that it could be generated via the cross-coupling of a beta hydroxy ester or derivative with a vinyl halide. However, it turns out that this is an extremely challenging cross-coupling reaction that is usually unproductive. 
Our group first encountered this reaction in the synthesis of amphotericin B, but it has reoccurred and posed a major challenge several times throughout various synthetic campaigns in our group. We decided to find a solution to this cross-coupling reaction and expected that it could be extremely enabling in the synthesis of polyketide type motifs in a stereospecific and highly modular manner. In order to understand why this cross-coupling was so challenging, we synthesized a secondary alkyl beta hydroxy bronic ester and submitted it to various Suzuki-Miura cross-coupling conditions using bromobenzene as the electrophile. We saw trace to low yields of the desired product and also identified that a major competitive side reaction was elimination of the hydroxyl group to form undesired alkene byproducts. This elimination likely occurs via a boron vitig type mechanism or palladium-mediated beta-heteroatom elimination. Regardless, we needed a general strategy that would allow us to bypass this beta-oxygen elimination problem. The solution we came up with was simply replacing the alcohol with a silo group. The silo group serves two roles. First, it acts as an alcohol surrogate. It does not eliminate under the cross-coupling conditions and can then be stereospecifically oxidized to the desired alcohol product via Tamau oxidation. Second, the silo group can be functionalized to provide an activating effect, rendering an otherwise unreactive pinnacle bronic ester hyperreactive towards transmetallation. Okay, so how do we go about synthesizing one of these beta silyl pinnacle bronic ester nucleophiles? Starting from a terminal alkyne, we perform a crab reaction that yields a terminal aline. Next, a palladium catalyzed salaboration reaction yields this vinyl pinnacle bronic ester that we can then reduce using a diamide reduction. Now we can swap that phenyl ring attached to the silicon atom for a chlorine atom using iodine monochloride and then we can substitute at silicon using a variety of different nucleophiles to access our final cross-coupling partners. We generated a variety of these nucleophiles and submitted them to the Suzuki Mira cross-coupling conditions with bromobenzene as the electrophile and then took those crude reaction mixtures and performed a Tamau oxidation on them to yield what we hoped would be a homobenzylic alcohol product. The first nucleophile we tried, we just used a beta dimethylphenyl silo substituted pinnacle bronic ester and actually saw formation of no product, but as we incorporated oxygenation on the silicon atom, we actually began to see yields of the desired product. Ultimately, we found that a 2,6-dimethoxyphenoxy substituent was able to yield the most productive cross-coupling reaction. So we went ahead with this derivative of the nucleophile. We tested our cross-coupling oxidation sequence now with a variety of different aryl halides. You can see a couple of the yields here, and I just want to point out the crystal structure of the nucleophile that we were able to obtain. Uh, it kind of shows just how sterically hindered that nucleophilic carbon atom actually is, and speaks to the activating effect of the beta silo group. From here, knowing that this strategy was productive, we were really interested in the stereochemistry of the transmetallation step. And until now, we had only really performed reactions with racemic mixtures of the nucleophile, so we needed an asymmetric route to these beta silo pinnacle bronic esters. The route we ended up going with starts from a vinyl pinnacle bronic ester. First, we run an enantioselective platinum catalyzed hydrocellulation reaction. This is a reaction developed by the Morkin group. This yields a geminal silo bronic ester in about 94 to 6 ER. We can run this on about 11 gram scale, it works really nicely. The next step is a lithiation borylation reaction using conditions from the Agarwal group. This yields the vicinal salaboronic ester, which can now be converted to the activated nucleophile by treating first with iodine monochloride, and then second with 2,6-dimethoxyphenol. So this gives us nucleophile DRs of about 94 to 6, but it can actually be increased by additional chromatography. And we can also synthesize the anti-diastereomer by just switching the enantiomer of the ligand that we use for the hydrocellulation reaction, then just running that geminal salobronic ester through the rest of the same synthetic sequence, and now we get the anti-diastereomer. So both of these are readily accessible. We took our stereoisomerically enriched nucleophiles and submitted them to the cross-coupling oxidation sequence with a variety of aryl halides and actually saw retention of stereochemistry across the board and extremely high levels of stereospecificity. So you can see for most of these examples, we're getting greater than 99% diastereospecificity, which essentially means perfect retention of stereochemistry. For the anti-diastereomer, we see a slight decrease in diastereospecificity, but similar yield. 
Interestingly, if you start with 95 to 5 DR of the syn nucleophile submitted to the coupling oxidation sequence, you can actually get out greater than 99 to 1 DR of the desired homobenzylic alcohol product, which we expect is due to kinetic resolution, and I'll touch again upon this later. I just want to point out a couple challenges with this reaction. If the methyl group on the nucleophile is switched for an ethyl group, we start to see lower yields, as well as for the syn diastereomer, slightly lower diastere specificity over the course of the coupling oxidation sequence. But interestingly for the syn diastereomer, we also see formation of this rearranged product with high levels of stereospecificity and about 15% isolated yield. If you're interested in a proposed mechanism for that, please check out the SI of the ACS catalysis paper. Now if we look at the anti-diastereomer of the ethyl containing nucleophile, we're now getting again perfect stereochemical retention, although with diminished yield, but we don't really see any formation of that rearranged product. Finally, we attempted to utilize various vinyl halides in the cross-coupling oxidation sequence, and we saw perfect stereospecificity but greatly diminished yields which tends to be a common theme across many of the SP3 Suzuki reactions in the literature. Vinyl halides are actually extremely challenging to access. And this is really unfortunate for us because these are the kinds of electrophiles that we need to employ to start to access polyketide type natural products. So just a, a small primer for what's going on in, in the group. We are currently kind of all in on solving this problem. We built a new CSP3 cross coupling synthesis machine where we can run dozens of these coupling reactions with different conditions simultaneously. So you can look out for that work sometime in the future, hopefully near future. We became interested in understanding the activating effect provided by that beta silo substituent. So we went ahead and performed a variety of preliminary mechanistic experiments. The first experiment, we took a secondary alkyl pinnacle bronic ester and submitted it to the cross-coupling conditions with bromobenzene as the electrophile and observed no cross-coupling product, but about 60% recovered starting material. This suggests that that beta silo group is required for the cross-coupling to be productive. Next, we took our beta silo pinnacle bronic ester nucleophile and put it into an NMR tube under aqueous basic conditions and observed that a tetracoordinate boronate species was forming in solution. Now this is not surprising, however, what was interesting was that 2,6-dimethoxyphenol was also being released under these reaction conditions and it was happening extremely rapidly. So we wondered if our actual cross-coupling partner could potentially be a pinnacle siloxaborylate. So I was able to independently synthesize this compound with this reaction scheme shown here and we actually took the pinnacle siloxaborylate, submitted it to the cross-coupling oxidation sequence and saw that we could achieve Again, perfect stereospecificity in the suzuki mira cross-coupling reaction, suggesting that this is likely an intermediate, at least, in our cross-coupling reaction. Interestingly, the reaction with the siloxaborylate is only productive if you don't add additional base. Additional base actually shuts down reactivity, and these nucleophiles are actually nice, stable crystalline solids. And we've actually switched over to using these for most of our reaction development now because we don't need to add additional base, so they're quite convenient and nice. To try to get a better idea of what was going on during the actual cross-coupling reaction, we teamed up with the Hein Group at the University of British Columbia. The Hein Lab has built a real-time automated HPLC analysis setup that allows for the monitoring of a variety of different species simultaneously all while a reaction is proceeding. The first question we aimed to answer using the Hein Lab's powerful HPLC setup was whether or not the pinnacle siloxaborylates we identified previously were stable under aqueous conditions or if perhaps they were hydrolyzing to dihydroxy siloxaborylates. This is what the HPLC analysis actually looks like. And you can see we're starting with a mixture of pinnacle siloxaborylates. So we can see actually the syn diastereomer with the shaded circles and the anti diastereomer with the open circles. Now, just in DMSO, we see both of these species are stable, but as soon as we add aqueous cesium hydroxide, we rapidly see them disappear, and we see the formation of two new species in orange, which we have identified as dihydroxy siloxaborylates. So it looks like under aqueous conditions, we're actually forming dihydroxy siloxaborylates, and these could be the active nucleophiles in the cross-coupling reaction. Okay, so we took a step back and now tried to look at the entire hydrolysis sequence starting with our beta silo pinnacle bronic ester nucleophiles that most of the paper had actually focused on. 
So I'm showing with the blue circle, a mixture of one-to-one syn to anti Barbados L pinnacle brown ester nucleophiles. And you can see as soon as aqueous cesium hydroxide is added, we see formation of both the pinnacle siloxaborylates shown in green and dihydroxy siloxaborylates shown in orange. And you can see that the pinnacle siloxaborylates remain in low concentration over the course of the experiment, whereas the dihydroxy siloxaborylate appears to be the major nucleophile in solution. So we expect this is probably the actual active cross-coupling partner. Next, we took a look at the actual cross-coupling reaction profile. And what's different about this plot than you've seen previously is that now we're actually analyzing formation of the silanol product without oxidation using the Tamau reaction. So you can see over the course of the reaction disappearance of dihydroxysiloxaborylates, but interestingly, we see formation of the syn product at a faster rate than formation of the anti product. So this is evidence now for kinetic resolution, where perhaps transmetallation of the syn nucleophile is faster than that of the anti nucleophile. This is one hypothesis that we're currently working with, but this does tend to explain the fact that we do see increases in DR from starting material to product for the syn diastereomer, and we can see a slight decrease in DR for the anti diastereomer, and this is regarding the cross coupling scope that I'd shown previously. So with that, I'd like to just thank Matthew for having me on, giving me the opportunity to share my research with everyone. Thank you to everybody that tuned in for this. I'd like to thank the entire Burke group at the University of Illinois, specifically Marty, my PI. Marty has just been super supportive and an awesome advisor throughout my PhD. His lab's just been a great place to work in. So thanks, Marty. And I want to give a shout out to Professor Jason Hine and Christy at the University of British Columbia. They're just great collaborators and they're so good at what they do and, it, and it's just been a joy working with them. So I'm really excited to continue collaborating with them. I'll thank our funding sources. And finally, anyone that has any questions, please feel free to contact me on, on Twitter or by email. I'm always happy to talk about chemistry and hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thanks. Thank you for tuning in for this Research Spotlight episode and thank you to Antonio for a great talk. If you enjoyed the episode, you can support us by subscribing and telling your peers about this podcast. And feel free to send us any questions or comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date and see you all next time.